Um, hello, and my name is uh, Diego Kid. I'm a first year JSD student here at uh, the law school. Uh, on behalf of the staff of Program in Law and Society, I would like to welcome you to this uh, event. Um, as you may know, the Stanford Program in Law and Society is a student-run program aimed at promoting and advancing social, legal, interdisciplinary scholarship. Uh, this program showcases Stanford Law School's leading law and society research and raises awareness of law and society as a rigorous discipline in the analysis of law in the broader social context. As part of our regular series of conversations on important, important topics that have been addressed from the law and society perspective, Today we are delighted to have Professor Kiri Calavita again with us. Uh, Professor Kiri Calavita is the Chancellor's Professor Emerita of Criminology, Law and Society at the University of California, Irving. Irvine. She was Irvine? Irvine. 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 It's very difficult for me to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> she was president of the Law and Society Association in 2000 and 2001, and is a Thorsten Selling Fellow of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. She's a very prolific scholar and has published extensively in the fields of immigration law and policy and in the field of white collar crime. Among her books, we can find Inside the State, the Bracero Program, Immigration and the INS, published in 1992. Big Money Crime, Fraud and Politics in the Saving and Loan Crisis, published in 1997 with co-authors Henry Pantel and Robert Hillman, and Immigrants at the Margins. Law, Race, and Exclusion in the Southern Europe, published in 2005. Her more recent book is Invitation to Law and Society, an Introduction to the Study of Field Law, published in 2010. Today she will present part of her current research which examines the inmate grievance process and legal mobilization in California prisons. Professor Calavita will present for about 30 minutes, and then we will open the session for Q&A. So thanks again, Professor Calavita, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction and for inviting me. Um, yes, yeah, so the paper I want to share you with, with you today is, I don't know, how many of you were at a talk I gave on this project a year ago? I was. <laughs> um, so this is, this is about the same project, but it's a different angle. Uh, and this particular paper is currently under review at Social Problems. So uh, we welcome your feedback. Uh, let me start by telling you uh, one story. California prisoner Henry Robinson, and all the names, of course, are pseudonyms here, but this is a real case. California prisoner Henry Robinson had served 30 years of a life sentence in maximum security prison in California. 23 of which he'd served in solitary confinement, otherwise known as administrative segregation, or as the prisoners call it, the whole. He'd served 23 years in solitary confinement because he'd been deemed a gang member, something he didn't dispute. But for the last seven years, he had been out of solitary confinement as a deactivated gang member and had been in an ordinary cell. One day he was told that he was being sent back to the whole because gang-friendly literature had been found in his cell. Uh, he insists that he's neither a gang member, nor was the literature that was found in his cell gang-affiliated. To contest his new classification and his return to the whole, he filed an internal grievance known as the 602 after the form that this grievance is written on. His grievance appeal was denied at all three levels of review, by the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, what I'll refer to as the CDCR. So every year, tens of thousands of California prisoners file grievances like this, um, the overwhelming majority of which are denied. Uh, it's actually hard to get a precise uh, percentage on the denial rate uh, for various reasons, but all the evidence we have suggests that the overwhelming majority are denied. Some of these are seemingly less serious than this one from Henry Robinson, and others involve life and death matters. So this paper treats these grievances as examples of legal mobilization or disputing, and asks what we can learn about both prison, because we know so little about this major institution in contemporary society, 
and also about disputing in general by looking through this lens of inmate grievances. My co-author and I were given unique access to a random sample of all the prisoner grievances in California filed in the fiscal year 2005-2006, from which we took a random sample of about 500. Uh, as well as the unique opportunity to interview a random sample of prisoners at as many prisons as we wanted to visit, uh, and we did three prisons and interviewed 120 randomly sampled prisoners, including people who were, in fact, in the hall, administrative seg segregation, who came in in shackles, as uh, well as people in protecting other kinds of protective custody and maximum, minimum, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, before going into the details of the findings, uh, let's look at what the disputing studies have shown in the past. So, the key findings from the conflict dispute and legal mobilization literature uh, basically establish uh, that the willingness and ability of people to identify a problem, <coughs> blame someone for it, and mobilize action or launch a dispute is socially patterned. The presence of grievable problems, even really serious grievable problems, such as are encountered, for example, in prison, is not in itself sufficient to explain why somebody would launch a grievance. This is what the literature calls just I know. Abel and Surratt uh, talked about a pyramid of disputes, and I'm not good enough technologically to have drawn this picture properly. But if I've drawn the picture properly, you know, down here you have some unnamed terrain of potential problems. Here you have a certain number of problems that are recognized as people as injurious. In the middle would be claim, uh, blaming some third party, some other party for it. And at the very top of the pyramid, you, you would have the grievances that are actually launched or the, claim, the, the complaints that are actually claimed. So this is known uh, after Fossener et al.'s uh, article in 1980-81 as the naming, blaming, claiming process. And the pyramid looks like that. So other key findings of this literature, starting with the articles in 2000, I mean in 1981 in a, a special issue of Law Society Review, uh, establish that there are certain social and psychological factors that inhibit a person climbing that pyramid of disputes, right? They even inhibit even people recognizing certain grievous situations as injurious to them, that initial naming process. And these social and psychological factors include self-blame, so that people who blame themselves for a situation are unlikely even to <coughs> recognize or identify or talk about that situation as injurious, much less claim uh, grievances, uh, 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 remedies for it. People also talk about, and I'm, that's what I'm going to pick up on a lot in this talk, the self-blame thing, but people also talk a lot about certain elements of American ideology. Uh, Chris and Buehmiller talks about the ethic of survival and her discussion of why uh, African Americans in the past haven't filed more uh, complaints about workplace discrimination. She argues that this ethic of survival it, it operates such that people don't like to see them or people think it's undignified to see themselves as victims, you know, that somebody's gotten the better of them, that implies. And that there's some um, there's some virtue in weathering the storm on your own. That's what she found in her interviews with people who did, did or did not file complaints against their employers. Uh, Faustiner et al. talk about the cult of competence, which is similar to what Hugh Miller talks about. That is, there is an American ideology, a sense that you should be self-sufficient. The American individualism is such that you should be self-sufficient and take care of your problems on your own, weather the storm. And thirdly, this literature and others, for example, Cal Marl and, and his colleagues studied uh, high school students and whether or not they brought complaints about certain forms of violation of civil rights. <coughs> and all of this literature suggests, and this is really important, all of this literature suggests that stigmatized and or vulnerable populations are far less likely to climb the pyramid of disputes, less likely to name, blame, and ultimately claim. 
both because of the way that stigmatization interacts with the self-blaming process, and because of the vulnerability and fear of consequences to sticking your neck out and making a claim, for example, against your employer. So all of these things are going to be relevant that nobody has ever studied, to my knowledge, at least I don't think anybody's ever published a study about what happens in prison. A lot of this the literature, Elizabeth Hoffman, for example, has studied the workplace and finds stigmatization and vulnerability are, are, are operative there in terms of tamping down claiming. So it's in this context, in the context of that literature and others that I won't go into because I want to get through this, um, we decided to study the inmate grievance process. And the context for this is that in 1996, Congress passed what's known as the Prison Litigation Reform Act, which was meant to, at a time, 1996, I don't know how how much you know about American prisons. But this is at a time when incarceration had been on the increase many times over. So four times as many people in prison in 1996 as had been in prison in the United States in 1970. The result of this was a massive increase in inmate litigation. Also, it coincided with civil rights consciousness and so forth. Massive increase civil uh, litigation by prisoners in the courts. Congress passed the Reform Act, PLRA, explicitly to reduce the amount of inmate litigation. It did many things like increase the fee, uh, fees on filing and like capping lawyers' fees and various things. But the thing that's relevant for this uh, project is the exhaustion provision. And that is that no prisoner in the United States can get into court to contest prison conditions without first exhausting all such administrative remedies as are available, whether or not they're deemed effective or anything. If they're available, if the state makes remedies of any kind available, you as a prisoner have to exhaust those before you can get to court. In California, the relevant section says any inmate or parolee under the department's jurisdiction may appeal any department action, etc., policy, which they can demonstrate as having an adverse effect, effect on their welfare. And I won't go into the details of it, but there's an informal level of review that actually I've done away with since I did this study. But then three formal levels. The third formal level ends up in Sacramento in a special appeals branch office. In the year that we did, in the year that that we drew grievances, the random sample of grievances, 2005, 2006, over 17,000 of these grievances made their way up to the third level of review. And many more tens of thousands dropped out along the way. <coughs> so the research questions we start out with is to look at this naming, blaming, and claiming among prisoners. One is, what are the problems that prisoners name, or what are the issues that prisoners name as problematic? How frequently do they launch claims under the grievance system? What do these prisoners file grievances about? And what can we this tell us about the socially patterned nature of naming, blaming, and claiming <coughs> among this heavily stigmatized and extremely vulnerable population? Hint, it contradicts the literature. How can we explain this contradiction? So that's where we're headed. OK, so we uh, went into. We went into three California prisons, and I won't. I can discuss issues of access just uh, briefly. It took us two years to get all the permissions to do this study but between the Department of Corrections and the IRBs and so forth. But mostly the Department of Corrections. It took us two years to get through all that. But the three the three prisons we chose varied according to level of security. We did minimum, medium, and maximum security. Uh, we did prisons that had more or, le uh, more or less frequent filings. All of them had a lot of filings, but there were some variation. We chose uh, different levels of filing by the prisoners. Uh, and they were all over the state. So those, that's some, uh, and these were of course pseudonyms. We're not telling you which prisons we went into because some of the descriptions of the people could actually reduce their uh, anonymity. But they're, uh, there's some description. They're all overcrowded, of course, even more so when we were there. 
So we studied, so we interviewed 120 men in these three prisons, and as I said, there were total random samples. We got rosters from the CDCR of every prisoner in the prison, and we did a random selection. Uh, which again is sort of unheard of because the prisons had no, the, the prison officials had no influence on, on who we were going to talk to. Uh, and in fact, these 120 men, and we had about a 92% participation rate. I mean, the guys really wanted to come and talk to us. So that, and we had permission by the department as well as the men to tape record. So we have tens of thousands of pages of what they told us. Um, I think only. Three guys out of 120 asked that they not be tape recorded. Um, interestingly enough, the department gave us permission to tape record the prisoners, but when we went to interview the staff, we weren't given permission <laughs> to tape record the staff. I forgot to mention that, <coughs> and we also interviewed CDCR staff. Okay, so these 120 men, you can see from this, if you can see it, can you all see it? Um, comparable to the general CDCR population. Um, on just about all the relevant variables. I want to just tell you one thing about the participation rate. I was worried that they would not want to talk to us, but one day I went in to interview a guy and he got, he was told he had to go back to his cell for the count. And he said, oh, he wanted to finish the interview. And, and I said, yeah, but then after you do the count, it's going to be lunchtime. And he said, he'd just wait. So I went out. After two more hours of interviewing somebody else, I went out to the hall, and there he was sitting waiting. And I said, you're going to miss lunch. He said, oh, this is way better than lunch. <laughs> I get lunch every day. <laughs> you know, so it was just, you know, partly something different, and partly that a lot of the guys don't get to talk to many people who aren't either uh, prison officials or other prisoners. Okay, so the first thing we did was talk to them. At the very beginning, talk to them about what things are problematic for them in prison. What are, you know, the naming, the naming thing. Interestingly enough, at first, um, even the guy coming in in shackles, you know, and I did an interview another guy, and it, you know, they have these metal cages, sort of human cages that they put <coughs> um, You ask them how you're doing, how, how's it going for you, and the majority say fine. You know, it's just, I guess that's just how deep the, the norm is that that's what you say when somebody says, how are you, right? But in talking to them, it comes, it, it, a lot of things come up. So what is it that they name as problems? Here's a hierarchy of the things that these guys mention as problems. The single largest category is kind of a miscellaneous category, so I don't even sort of count that because it lumps a lot of things together. But living conditions. Like it's too darn hot. Some of these prisons are in the desert, and it can be 100 degrees in their cells. But too darn hot. Another prison we visited was really old, and it had ants and roaches all over the place, and they complained about that. All various living conditions. Uh, so 42.5% of the guys uh, mentioned living conditions as, as problematic. Second, though, was staff disrespect. 37.7% brought that up on their own. Lack of programming and jobs, programming like the drug addiction programs or job training, lack of, of that, lack of jobs for them. Medical was huge, 18.9% mentioned medical. Lack of for, fair play, which is kind of like a general category. But I want you to notice here that way down the list, number 16, is property, which means that their property has gone missing or has been damaged by the CDCR. You know, some guy came in to search my cell and he broke my radio, that type of thing. Or somebody sent me some stamps from home and the post office didn't deliver it to me. Just to give you the flavor of some of the things they told us, uh, living conditions, they say, you have the way they feed you, the cleanliness of the place, how it looks. You've got ants and roaches and stuff you can't get rid of, no matter what you do. Medical, I lost my hearing and my eye was drooping almost closed. It took them four days to see me when they finally did. The doctor thought I had Bell's palsy and I'd lost some hearing in one of my ears. The officers are here. The officers here are on some kind of power trip, most of them, because you're over because you're over somebody doesn't mean you can just treat them any kind of way or talk to them any kind of way. We're human beings just like you are. They got their way of doing what they want to do. 
Say like I'm a cop and I don't like you, I'm going to get this big rapist dude and put him in a cell with you, or I'm going to pay him some lunches or give him something to get you, or I'm going to tell the blacks that the whites are whoop de whoops or stuff like that. Oh man, all that stuff gets on, really happens like they say on TV. It really does happen. Later on in the interview he says it really gets under your skin. On property, pictures came up a lot because pictures take on a very strong emotional value because they represent often the only way these the guys see their family or their girlfriends and so forth. And this one guy said, my pictures and stuff was in there, the stuff that was taken from him. That was really important to me. That's the only way I see my son was through those pictures. Okay, so now remember that one of the major findings in the literature on disputing is that self-blame is a major inhibitor of recognizing and identifying things as injurious and of filing complaints about them. <coughs> so we looked, we, we, asked, we, we asked questions about, um, one of the questions we asked was uh, whether or not they thought, and this was towards the end of the interview, whether or not they thought they'd been generally treated fairly by the criminal justice system. We were flabbergasted. 43%, like a strong, significant minority, said unequivocally, yes, they had. This doesn't mean necessarily within prison, uh, because we asked them to look at the whole spectrum of their, of their lives. And 34.7% uh, said that they themselves were to blame for their incarceration. Many others throughout the interviews interjected things about their own responsibility for being in prison. But this one question was about proclaiming themselves. 34.7% said it was their fault. They said things like, whose fault is it we brought ourselves here? It's pretty much my fault for being in here. These are all different people. You do the time, you do the crime, you do the time. We're in prison. If you don't like it, don't come back, you know. I broke the law and this is the price I have to pay. I know I deserve to be here. I know my mistakes, so I'm at peace. And this was my favorite, this last one, because this guy had been talking about how hard it was for him in prison and how bad the conditions were and was generally extremely critical and very angry. He leans across and he says, you know what? And this is later in the interview. And this is a secret, so don't tell my wife. I've actually asked for this because of what I was doing on the streets. There's a lot of sense of one's own accountability in these interviews. The surprising finding, though, that contradicts the literature is even among the people who are most self-blaming, they were fully capable and willing to name the conditions that were injurious and to file claims about them. One guy says, and one of the most self-blaming people we interviewed says, you know what though, if you come in here, you spend a week here, I can promise you that you'll say to yourself, this can't be right. So they're fully capable of identifying problems. Moving up the pyramid, prisoners filing grievances. 74% of the guys we talked to had filed at least one formal grievance over their problematic conditions. 76% of those had filed more than once. Several had filed dozens of times. We had one guy who said he'd filed, two guys said they'd filed over 100 times. The CDR, CDR refers to these people as frequent filers. A majority in every demographic group had filed. Even a majority of undocumented immigrants. Talk about a heavily stigmatized and vulnerable population. Every age, every race, ethnicity, the majority of each of those groups had filed. And even a majority of those who blamed themselves for being in prison had filed at least one grievance. Second thing that the literature talks about is vulnerability and the fear of consequences of filing inhibits people from filing. Once again, though, three quarters of the guys in our sample had filed 
You couldn't be more vulnerable and stigmatized than these prisoners. Furthermore, they fully recognized that they might face retaliation for filing. 61% of these guys, even before being asked, they independently offered in the interview, which turned into conversations. I forgot to tell you, these conversations lasted. Shortest one was 30 minutes. The longer was more than two and a half hours, the longest. So they raised things outside of the actual interview questions that we had to cover. They raised things themselves. And 61% independently raised that they faced potential retaliation for filing a grievance. And yet they did it anyway. Uh, we had a series of agree-disagree statements and uh, 70, more than 70% agreed with the statement that correction officers retaliate against people who file grievances. Here's some examples of things they said. I know there's always consequences. I'm too close to the house, which means getting out, his release date. So most of the issues is not worth me filing a 602 and then being a target by the correction officers. I just want to do my time and get out of here. I don't need no extra time. A lot of it was about the release dates being important, and they didn't want to you know, jeopardize that. I'm just trying to go home, but this dude is just pushing, 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 and that really tears you up because you get to thinking about, I want to see my granddaughter, who I haven't seen. Oh, man, they get under your skin. That's the same guy, by the way, that we saw earlier talking about problems. So in thinking about why it might be that in prison, the naming, claim, planning, claiming process might be so very different from what every other study of disputing has found, we began thinking about the institutional context of prison and how it's different. I mean, aside from the fact that it's an extreme version of vulnerability and loss of autonomy, but there's other things about prison that are interesting here. And uh, when, you read, when you read these transcripts, you can't help but notice that Title 15, which is the California Code of Regulations that, that, uh, that lays out the treatment that, that, that they're to receive and, and, and the way officers are supposed to behave, and the DOM, which is the Department Operation Manual, their conversations are replete to sometimes quite sophisticated references to these documents. One of the, when you come into prison and get through reception, you get a copy of these documents, okay? So they, many of them are, are fully uh, 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 educated on, on what's contained. One guy said it's the Bible in here, the, uh, the Title 15. Um, so we're thinking about the way in which prison, I like to do a play on words with uh, Ewick and Silby's talking about the the commonplace of law, because what they're talking about in their book is about the way law permeates everyday life, but largely remains subterranean under the surface. And what we're proposing is that in prison, in fact, prison is a context which represents the uncommonplace of law, because it, law is so explicit and so conspicuously on display in prison uh, that you can't avoid uh, um, noticing, right? And so it suggests to us that it's not perhaps surprising that when law is so conspicuously on display, uh, there is more, more engagement with it, more legal mobilization. And in fact, the guy said things like, there's rules and regulations for us to follow, and in the DOM, they have rules and regulations to follow. When they break a rule, they should be punished. They break a rule, we go get that book, meaning the Title 15, and write it up. In prison, the levers are all conspicuously on display. So this is one part of this, uh, of this explanation. Uh, but it turns out, as always, uh, it's even more complicated. Because it turns out that these guys are, maybe not surprisingly, not immune to the sense of vulnerability and fear that the, guard, that the guards and staff will retaliate. And this comes out in looking at what kinds of retaliation they really fear. I mean, they fear retaliation for their release dates, but what kind of retaliation do they talk about as being most prominent, most inevitable? 
And that is their fear of retaliation when you allege staff misconduct. They fear if they file a complaint against staff that it's particularly that kind of complaint that it's going to result in retaliation. Maybe not from that particular guy, but from one of his buddies. One of his buddies will find a way to turn your cell upside down or confiscate some property or jeopardize your release date. So it is particularly when it comes to staff complaint that they in fact uh, uh, fear retaliation. And there are some, there are some quotes about that. So, it's interesting then to look at the pattern of grievances that they file. I mentioned that 75% of them practically have filed a grievance. And I listed the things that they name as problems. But when you look at the types of grievances they filed on, it turns out that things go upside down. And that is that the number one thing they file on is missing or bit damaged property. And by the way, it turns out by talking to the CDC our staff in, in our interviews with them, when we ask them what are the easiest grievances to remedy, it's property. 19.4% of all the grievances that these guys had filed involved property. Living conditions came in second, medical third, disciplinary fourth, <coughs> staff complaints a distant fifth, tied with lack of programming and jobs. So if you look at this naming and claiming thing, on the problems named, property came in 16th. Grievances filed, it came in first. And staff complaints fell down to number five. Uh, so So what we have is kind of two, two prong findings. One is that the naming, blaming, and claiming process is not uh, in prison, is not does not mirror that process in even in the workplace where people are do sense some vulnerability. It doesn't seem that self blame nor even retaliation per se inhibit filing, with three quarters of these guys having filed. Um, and we argue that this is because of the institutional context which can enhance mobilization and in fact trump the social and psychological factors that have been found in other contexts uh, to tamp down claiming. Uh, the exception is in the case of um, filing against staff, uh, which is perhaps not surprising given their vulnerability. Uh, when they file staff complaints. And so this is a story, in a sense, about the power and importance of institutional context. And that that institutional context can really uh, offset or be more important than um, psychological or social factors that aren't relating to the institution itself. So we have 1.30, so we have lots of room for What's the thing um, with the, the high incidence of property and low incidence of um, staff complaints? What the um, this DOM or the, mm -hmm. the guidelines sort of allow you to file on, and how difficult it is to fit your complaint within the provisions of the rule? So it may be that you can explain the high incidence of property and the low incidence of staff complaints, just maybe in part because you have to allege more. Um, stuff that doesn't fit neatly within the rules or stuff. No, the rules are very, I mean, the rule is very, very broad. And really, I mean, it says anything, including, and, and in fact, it's interesting, because you could do a, a, a different study on this, because in fact, when we talked to the CDCR officials at all levels, they told us that the 602 was for grieving any violation of policy. But they argued that it's not relevant for grieving a policy. In other words, if a guy says, we only get six hours of yard a week, mm -hmm. that's the policy. And that's unconstitutional. That's cruel and unusual punishment. Right. They'll just dismiss that, because that's not a violation of policy. But it's interesting, because the regulation says they're allowed to grieve any 
condition or policy. In fact, they might often want to take that policy to court, which is why they're trying to exhaust remedies. So just with staff complaints, I wonder if what they describe as a problem with the staff is actually a violation of a policy by mm -hmm. staff members, right? Mm -hmm. So when they just, you know, look at you in a degrading way mm -hmm. or use language that's not, you know, on the books not allowed but is just mm -hmm. demeaning, that could certainly be seen as a problem, but there's it wouldn't be a violation books, of a policy, so you wouldn't be able to run well, it is, a violation. it is a violation of policy if the staff close your racial epithet, for example. That is a violation. Is that what you kind of think? Yeah, about? yeah, but I, I wasn't sure if the problems were all, you know, calling you a racial epithet or just, you know, they put someone in your cell or they stir the pot on racial animosity by... Oh, no, no, it has like to be that something... that won't be capturable. Right, right. It has to be something uh, discreet, concrete, like... Uh, it often has to do with, for example, the guy came in and threw my cell upside down and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, um, yeah, called me a racial epithet. Or, yeah. Yeah, it would not be sufficient to say uh, the, the guy, um, you know, that, I don't know, something day. It has to be, yeah. Two questions there. Oh, no. Agnes. Um, how much... Uh, I'm sorry, you're not Angus, you're Katie. No, I'm you're Katie, Katie, but I figured that that was pretty close. <laughs> um, you're Katie, wondering. right? I am, yeah. yeah. Fine. Second choice, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, well, I have a couple of questions, but um, one is just how much do prisoners tend to know about each other's grievances? Do they talk about this kind of successful, that kind usually isn't? Yes, yes. They, they talk a lot to each other about these kinds of things. <coughs> and in fact, the CDCR staff is fully aware that they talk to each other about these kinds of things. And some of the low grant rate is explained by, I mean, one person talked about a deny that they had given uh, a grievance, and I think it was over a staff complaint, if I remember correctly, but anyway, uh, they denied it. And, and this person turned to me and said, can you imagine the consequence if we granted this? And that guy went back to his cell block and said, hey, guys, look what I got. I got it. You know, so they're fully aware that they talk to each other. Yeah, and they know the kinds of things that, you know, are more likely to work, the kinds of things that are more likely to result in retaliation, which is why they fear so much staff complaints. Yeah. Just one person there. And then one person. Yeah, mine was um, just a very quick question on whether the, um, the inmates file their grievances by themselves or whether they get an external help to file mm -hmm. these grievances mm -hmm. or whether there's some inmates who help others to file them. Mm -hmm. Who is when they use the same? I think that that could be relevant because it would have a longer effect. So mm -hmm. right. All of the above. I would say All the vast the majority. Yeah, but I would say the vast majority because we did ask. Mm -hmm. um, we did ask them to talk about a total of. 212 incidents, right. um, and um, among the things we asked was, did you do this on your own, or did you ha have help yeah. with it? And most of them did it on their own, but there are people in prison who might be more, you have to be fairly literate to be able to put this together. Right. Right? Cool. Yes. yes, so some people ask for help with an inmate who's more literate than they are, and... Okay, but only at, that, at the inmate level, they can... Yeah, sometimes they get outside help too, but that's, it's more rare. Yeah. Thank you. It's also interesting, somebody said once to us, uh, well, it's obvious why they file so much, because they have to file in order to get to court. I mean, they have to exhaust remedies. It turns out that a tiny min minority of these, only 5% of these grievances, only, let me put it this way, only 5% of the prisoners had taken a grievance to court after they exhausted remedies. Uh, so it doesn't, and, 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 and I suppose one could argue that even if it were in order to get to court, the theoretical thing doesn't change because that going to court is also a form of claiming, of course. Right? But it is, most of these do not. Most of these end at, first of all, they usually end before they get to the third level, and even those who go all the way to the third level, the prisoner just you know, gives up on them. 
And are there any data that show the connection between uh, the uh, 602 complaints being filed and extension of their sentencing, the mm -hmm. retaliation? That oh, they, they told us about it. Are there actual data to connect those causal? Oh, I don't know that we would have data on that. No, I, I mean, I don't have any data on that. I only have the anecdotal data from the prisoners, some of whom told us that after they had filed a complaint, they got days added onto their release date. No. There's no other, for, with no other factors being present mm -hmm. other than the fact that they submitted no. it. There would, be, there would be factors brought up yeah. by the uh, CDCR. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was up to yeah, uh, I just, uh, it's really very interesting, but I didn't quite follow the point about uh, the absence of self-play. Mm -hmm. That is, if a prisoner says, well, I deserve to be in here, mm -hmm. that doesn't seem to me to be to negate, um, well, you could say, I don't deserve, I do deserve to be in here, but I don't deserve to have cockroaches. That's right. So I thought that, that the fact that they, that so many would say, well, I deserve to be in here, mm -hmm. doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean they blame themselves mm -hmm. for what they're grieving. That's about. exactly right. That's exactly right. But that's not what you would predict by the literature. The literature suggests that if you're responsible yourself for a situation, you deserve what you get. At least that's my that's my understanding. Well, then yeah. the literature's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> the literature's clearly the, the literature's and I didn't address this, but the literature's also wrong on the cult of confidence and the survival thing. Because not a single guy mentioned anything remotely like what Bumuller had found had found among the African Americans who were not filing for racial discrimination. None of them. In fact, I taught last year I taught a course at San Quentin. I taught introductory sociology at San Quentin, which is separate from this whole project, but I did, you know, talk to the guys in my class about the grievance process, and I talked to them about Bumuller's findings, and how that uh, some people have argued that if you, com if you complain about uh, racial discrimination, that sort of locates you as a victim, and that the victim status is somehow undignified or, or makes them less than self-respecting or something. And these prisoners looked at me like I was crazy. You know, they said, well, no, not doing anything about it would make me a victim. No, I, you know, so I it was interesting bought, how- I they, never bought that. It totally yeah. did not resonate with them. You know, it's like you go to the doctor um, and you say, I have this symptom, treat it. That's not making you a victim. You want, you, you want to be helped. Mm -hmm. and you know, um, these people feel complaints about discrimination. They feel they're victimized. The complaining about it doesn't make them feel victimized. Right. It's the act of And furthermore, the lumping it, I mean, this one guy in particular said they didn't use the term lumping it, but uh, you know, the literature talks about lumping it, just sucking it up and not doing anything about it. And he said, that's what would make me feel like a victim. <coughs> yeah. So did you ask them about success at grievances? And yes. Do you have, I know this isn't a normative paper, but I'm just wondering if you got anything out of your research that suggests whether the grievance system is doing any serious work in improving conditions and if there could yes. be any reforms that might make it work better. That's a really good question, and it's not doing any serious, I, can, I think I can say unilaterally, it's not doing any serious work in improving conditions. Um, the, the grant rate is really hard to ascertain for a number of reasons. Uh, most important, the informal level, uh, which is a misnomer, is not really informal. It was a level at which the inmate was supposed to try to address the issue with the closest officer to them, to the issue, as long as it wasn't a staff complaint about that person. Okay, They would try to say, let's just give a trivial example, hey, you know, uh, we need more toilet paper in here or something. And uh, if at the most informal level where it's not even part of the 602 process, maybe the guy, the officer just gives them the toilet paper. But if he doesn't, 
of them, the person fills out a 602, informal, but he writes it down on the same 602 form. The only way in which it's informal is that it's not logged into the system, and the answer is informal. So, so your 17,000 includes both informal and formal? Uh, so we have the informal right narrative of the inmate. But, but when you said there's 17,000 grievances. Yes, that, that's, that's, that's 17,000 that made it all the way to the third level. So that includes all three. three levels. That includes all the levels. Yeah. But the problem with understanding how many are granted in any precise scientific way is because that informal level isn't even logged in, much less do we know what happened to, you know, in the way of a response. Uh, also complicating that is at the formal levels where we do know what the responses were, because the CDCR gave us the information in terms of deny and grant. Unfortunately, and I don't know if this is coincidental or deliberate, they lump together in the grant category both grants and what they call partial grants. And partial grants are completely bogus. Partial grants, I mean, because we, we have this random sample of grievances and we see the partial grants and we see what they say. They say things like, if there's a staff complaint, for example, uh, they're complaining about a certain officer and they say, and you need to investigate this and this guy needs to be disciplined. Partial grant, we're looking into it. That's a partial grant and that's lumped with grants, okay? Another partial grant is your staff should be trained. Uh, all our staff get trained, partial grant. So these partial grants are lumped in with the grants and they're not substantive grants at all. So it's very hard to disentangle. What we do have is at the third level, which is not a great illustration because at the third level, they do break down granted, partial grant, and denied. And at that level, something like uh, 5% are partial grants, 95% are deny, and 0.1% are grant, something like that, at the third level. Which doesn't mean that that's all there is at previous levels, because like, you know, you would expect sort of a siphoning out, right, as it goes up. So but it the does most territorious still, would be dealt with at the lowest level? One might think. One might think. One might think. Yeah. We don't, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it does give you a ratio of the grants to partial grants. And if you extrapolate that ratio of grants to partial grants at lower levels, then you can try to untangle that big category, you know, of grants. Anyway, it's complicated, but all of the evidence we do have suggests that in fact, when we interviewed um, at the prisons, we interviewed the uh, appeals coordinators who are responsible for uh, orchestrating all of the appeal, uh, responding to the appeals. And we asked them, one woman had worked there 10 years in that capacity. And we were asking them, can you give us an example of one that you've granted in full? And she sat there, scratched her head. And she said, you know, I can't think one, it's so rare. So that kind of anecdotal evidence is, is you know, compared with the other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, are there distinctions between the prison and employment context that might explain the differences? Or do you think that you would find the same kind of conclusions in the employment <coughs> context as well, and that the sort of the arguments in the employment context probably would have? You mean, should we take these data and suggest, like Professor Freeman just did, that that literature is wrong? That, in fact, if they looked better, they wouldn't find what they purport to find? Or, or, or just sort of um, empirically, you know, is employment context different so people have more stake or people can get promoted or whatever it is, so that that literature might be correct in the employment context, but there's differences in the stakes or realities of prison right. that would account for those differences. It's, it's, it's different from the employment mm -hmm. uh, uh, context in that, you know, a lot of the disputing literature talks about exit from the situation. You know, you just leave. If it's so bad at your workplace, not that it's that easy to quit your job, but that is always an ultimate option. In prison, you don't have that option. Um, the 
power, I mean, there's a lot of stuff on workplace uh, disputes that talk about the power asymmetry. And there's nothing like the power asymmetry of, of a prison. So there is that, but none of that, I can't seem to get my mind around being able to use those differences such that you could explain uh, the absence of self-blame and fear of retaliation as being inhibitors. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they're different in, in very obvious ways. But to my mind, still, the most obvious way they're different is the conspicuous presence of law in prison, okay. which, uh, which they then mobilize. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have the list of regulations, everybody, that you're supposed to follow, but they also have a list of regulations that the officials are supposed to follow. Right. And they're studying that. Right. Hi. Um, I want to suggest perhaps um, alternative or qualifying explanations to the flipping of the uh, okay. claiming the grievances and, mm -hmm. and, cla and uh, na naming them and claiming okay. them, uh, which I think can also be checked uh, using uh, the data that you have. Uh, which is, uh, well, one of them is, as you mentioned earlier, if many of the living condition grievances can be solved in the informal way, and there's so many of them, uh, it wouldn't be surprising that you would need a formal grievance to uh, deal with them later on, because you could probably solve many of them uh, informally. So they would appear in lesser percentages in the formal The grievance. living conditions? Yeah which took the 40-something percent in the naming uh, column, but then dropped down to number five or lower. Um, yeah. So th th that might be just, uh, I mean, it is still an institutional explanation, but it, they're easier to solve that way. But that might explain um, that. And an additional one, which would be? Well, the living conditions wasn't really so germane to my argument. But I mean, it was the replacement, is the falling down, it's the elevation of property that had been so far down on the list and the falling down of the staff complaints. The thing about living conditions, though, is that they're less likely to be, I mean, it's about the heat and the bugs and those things that are kind of like part of the environment. Um, so, so at least to address the, um, the um, uh, property one, that, that might still follow the, those uh, institutional considerations. I don't know if you, uh, you said it's hard to determine the success rates of mm -hmm. those grievances, but if those are indeed ones that are uh, more com commonly granted right. and, and inmates to discuss right. with one another, they would right. be like economically right. rational. That's true. To, That's to true. follow more the, those grievances that are right. uh, more uh, ready. Right. Yeah. right. I Given. believe the property ones are probably more likely, to, I mean, still not likely, but probably a tiny bit more likely than the other ones. Yes. And as Katie mentioned, word circulates as to what's mm -hmm. grievable, you know. And in fact, they have a big warehouse of radios. So if somebody breaks his radio, you know, they might say, okay, here. Right. It's easy. And, and then just finally, following up with Professor Friedman's comment, uh, I don't know if you have any uh, mentions of this in the data itself, but uh, would it be possible to see any distinction between a situation where uh, there's the same perpetrator-victim relationship? So inmates had done something wrong in, uh, while in prison, mm -hmm. then some uh, harm has been done in retaliation to them, and then whether they consider filing a grievance or not, in com compared to all those other grievances that are looking at a broader relationship where they first committed a crime outside of mm -hmm. prison where they are to be blamed for, and then there's their living conditions or anything that's related to their time in prison. Mm -hmm. So we might be able to, you, you might be able to detect uh, differences in their in this relationship of victimhood and uh, being to see if maybe uh, who had infractions and who didn't, and see right. if that makes right sense. or just if they if they if they've been treated differently or they perceive themselves differently uh -huh. in situations where they're they behaved badly inside prison uh -huh. and then were treated badly and possibly illegally or something that would give rise to uh, a grievance. Uh -huh. And just like whether they perceive that in different ways, uh -huh. it is it is one of the one of the major categories of grievances is disciplinary, which means they are grieving 
it, usually it's a 115 is the number of the, so a disciplinary action against them. And then they often grieve. I, I'm not sure if that's what you're referring yeah, to, but so they do. They file a claim, they file a grievance against the disciplinary action they received. A whole other paper could be written about procedural justice versus substantive justice because when these grievances are looked at, they look only at not did you do the infraction, but did you get due process in the assigning of this 115? So yes, I mean one of the categories is whether you know it's about a disciplinary. Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah. So I'm um, also interested in this disjuncture between the literature and your findings mm -hmm. with respect to like what kinds of grievances get brought up. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering what your thoughts were about if you're looking at a problem like race and employment discrimination. Um, that's a very amorphous type of harm in the sense that a lot of people disagree about when mm -hmm. discrimination mm -hmm. occurs mm -hmm. and because there's such disagreement there's a real risk that the victim takes mm -hmm. um, in mm -hmm. bringing forth that type of claim. Mm -hmm. He or she may not want to, to be mm -hmm. you know, perceived as mm -hmm. the type of person who causes problems or that kind of thing. So you're explaining the finding in the literature. Right, yeah. right. So that's one possible explanation is looking at the findings that you presented mm -hmm. which show that you know, people are more likely to bring claims when there's some very concrete, identifiable problem mm -hmm. that they can point to, like mm -hmm. my property went missing, mm -hmm. um, but are less likely to point to claims when they have the same kind of amorphous experience about, like, the staff person treating you very mm -hmm. poorly, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is a lot harder for them to demonstrate mm -hmm. or prove. Mm -hmm. um, it might be one way to reconcile, you know, mm -hmm. this disjuncture that we see in mm -hmm. what the literature is talking about and what right. our findings have been in this, your right. findings have been in this study. That's possible. I have to say that it, you know, what we have to go on is the data we collected. And um, we asked them about reasons that they, you know, why did you file and what did you expect and all these things. And then we had these long, you know, fairly long conversations with them and sort of didn't, you know, it doesn't come up. So it is, you know, one could, one could suggest that. In fact, one, maybe one, maybe, we should suggest that uh, one of the reasons for this is this disjunction with the literature is, I mean, that's, an, that's a very interesting uh, suggestion that you made. Uh, that is a more amorphous, at least it's under, that there are differences of opinion, so. Can, yeah. can, can I follow up sure. on that? Because I thought that was a very, very yes. interesting point. My impression, is, probably over, is that the literature on employment is very heavily Camped for discrimination, mm -hmm. which is, as he says, kind of uh, very subjective sometimes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is based on um, and sexual harassment too. Yeah. yeah. So this is a kind of informal non-research of say going to the bathroom in supermarkets where you go in the back mm -hmm. and so on. Is that the point you make about the ubiquity of law? Well, I often notice in, uh, in, in the stock rooms and so on that there's a huge poster right. listing California labor record that goes on and on and on. Um, so that there is a kind of pervasiveness in many employment contexts of yeah. law. Yeah. And so maybe the difference has to do with whether or not the grievance is something that concrete or subjective. So mm -hmm. I thought that was a really, mm -hmm. might be a very crucial mm -hmm. point about what it is about the legal mm -hmm. context which mm -hmm. which is in mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not saying that there isn't a big mm -hmm. difference between the prison and say employment, but there is a, a lot of rules and regulations mm -hmm. which are drummed sure. into people's head sure. on the job. Yeah, sure. That's true. Yeah. I have thought that I just lost some. <laughs> Maybe I'll come up in response to that. No, it's a no, it's a very good it's a very good point. Um, yeah. Okay, you, you can do another, the next paper. <laughs> just if I could follow up on that. Oh, right, yeah, right into that. The conspic. It's conspicuous in a different way in prison, in that the only thing a lot of these prisoners have to read are the rules. 
<laughs> and you know, it's a big poster, but you've got a job, you've got a family, you've got a life, you've got all these things to do. Right. Not to speak um, of there's watchtowers and armed guards everywhere. But, right, you know, but I mean, again, in prison, that's not, that's all they got. The palpable sense of law in the prison is different. But, and, and, and frankly, the process of elimination led me there, and the conversations of the men led me there, because they are always talking about law. They are always talking about the Title 15, it's the Bible, and we got rules to follow, and they should follow their rules too. I mean, it's all over their narrative. But I wish I could think of <laughs> the thought that just escaped me, because I wanted to go somewhere. Yeah, but that's, it's actually a very, very uh, good point. The CDCR actually, I know what I was going to say, they respond to these complaints as if they're entirely open to interpretation, in the sense that they refer to them as, he said, he said. You know, so he says the guard did this. The guard said he doesn't, he didn't do it. And by the way, of course, there's no contest as to, you know, it turns into who said, because they say, you know, as a sworn peace officer, if he says it, then says it didn't happen, then it didn't happen. So something that appears concrete to us you know, to them is a he said, he said situation. But um, it is it is an interesting point, because it's mostly about racial discrimination, sexual harassment, the literature on, on workplace, uh, with con often concrete consequences, like not getting the promotion or something, but um, which would be consistent with the lack of complaints against staff, in, in a way. Yeah. I wonder if another way of explaining the difference is sort of picking up on what you said about um, the victimization effect that in prison guys think if they don't say anything, that's what could make them a victim. Mm -hmm. I wonder if in this context, um, part of the reason why there's so, so many violence is their um, sort of only chance to assert their rights or yes. to have a voice, yes. and that's humanizing yes. in a way yeah. that um, yeah. when you have lots of opportunities to speak in different yes. forms and that sort of thing, you yes. just want to because yes. I always think, when I look at this data, I was like, gee, why do they file when they're, they're, if they're never granted? I know. There's a real question as to why you know they they're say. doing it, and part of it, I, I mean, so like they're not really interested in maybe the actual result, but they are interested well, in asserting they are. their voice. They were, they, the thing is, it's really interesting, because when we started off this, all we knew was very low grant rate, lots of filing. So I was brainstorming just, you know, in the absence of any other data, all the reasons that one might do this. And one of them was to exercise agency. Mm -hmm. And similarly, to get something off your chest. I mean, it is true, it's an exercise of agency, which, uh, but again, you know, when you're collecting data, you, you have, one could speculate it's about agency, but every which way we talked to them about that, it, it just didn't come out. It just didn't come out. One question, because I really wanted to find that, you know? And one question um, was something, and I can't remember exactly how we worded it, but do you ever write a grievances for additional reasons besides just, you know? And then we gave examples, almost like unscientific leading questions. Uh, like, for example, to get, just to get something off your chest, to get back, up, because I actually heard 602 being used as a verb uh, on more than one occasion. I heard one prisoner say to another, yeah, and the guard did this and that, and you know what, I'm going to 602 his ass. You know, so it becomes a verb in which you are getting back at someone who did something to you. Whether, you know. Um, and you didn't get that. And again and again and again, even no matter trying to phrase it in a subtle way that would make it okay for them to say yes, I, you know, once in a while they'd say, well, you had to get it off my chest too. Oh, I know. Another possibility was just to tell the story of what happened to you. You know, you just want to get it down on paper. It just didn't pan out. So I don't know what you do with that. It makes sense, but we have no data to suggest. You know what they did say? Because we said self. In other words, we went through the whole thing. Do you sometimes do this? No, 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 no. Then when you ask them, do you think others sometimes do it? There is more yeses. I'm not sure what to make of that, you know, except they're othering. You know, it's an othering process. But yeah, I mean, these, all of these are kind of really uh, great possibilities, but I just didn't find any way to be able to say that's what it is. Yeah. Is there a difference, though, between agency or getting something off your chest and the assertion of a right? So if 
the person is interested in actually yeah. doing they, they, that, they, then they wouldn't say, yeah, I would do it just to do something. Right. Um, it would have to be something that they would substantively recognize an as an entitlement. Yes. That um, would be, that would, I think that would resonate with them as asserting a right. In fact, one guy said, right is right and wrong is wrong, and I'm just going to do this. But that's kind of different than just an exercise in agency, right? It's a, it's a, I don't, I refuse to be a victim here, and I'm going to assert my right. Yeah. We have time for more, one more question, so thank you. Um, so they actually use rights language, that surprises me. Actually, uh, it's not a question, just not, uh, right as in right is right and wrong is wrong. Gotcha. But it's really, I, I, I gave a paper last year at, at the Law and Society Association in which I, revealed a different set of findings, and that is that they almost never talked about abstract rights. They talked about the Title 15. The concrete, this is what's supposed to happen in here, I'm supposed to get a shower every other day, and very concrete every day, but the discussions were almost never about, it's my constitutional right to be treated like a human being, or anything like that. It was all about this very local level department operation manual and the Title 15, which tells them that they're allowed to have a toothbrush and a shower and six hours of yard time and those kinds of very concrete everyday things, which I thought was really interesting finding too, because it conflicts with what you find in the grievance forms themselves, which is, you know, it's kind of like you think about it as an exercise, a study of legal consciousness, because the grievance forms and the, and the contextual nature of, of consciousness, because the grievance forms are replete with language about rights, because they know that's what's called for mm -hmm. in the formal arena. But in talking about it and in talking about the problems they have and the remedies they're seeking, it was never about abstract rights. In fact, at one point I started asking them, because we weren't hearing about it, at the end of the interview I'd say to a guy, well, what about constitutional rights? And they'd just laugh at us. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so before we finish, I just uh, have uh, three invitations for you. Um, these are upcoming events organized by the Staff Program in Law and Society. Next Tuesday at, at 5.30 uh, p.m., uh, Professor E. Z. Rosens V. from Tel Aviv University will speak about uh, the geography of sexuality. Uh, then on Wednesday at the same time, 5.30, uh, we have a very interesting event about law and society in Iran, uh, which uh, we will invite the three professors, distinguished professors, to talk about this. And it's about the historical overview of the Iranian legal system and legal reforms and human, uh, women rights in, in Iran. And then on February 24th, uh, we invited Professor Tom Tyler to talk on legitimacy and policy. So that are hope we will, I will, we will see you in the next events and want to thank you, Professor Kalabi. <laughs>